This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And today we're talking about saying yes to your players. Sure. Sounds like a good idea. What, 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 what did you saying call yes it? yes and. Oh, yes and. <laughs> he comes up with some weird things and sometimes I, I don't know what he's talking about. But I do on this one. Yes, a little bit. Anyway, so what happened is a uh, long time ago, uh, people were running games like me. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not an old man, but I'm getting there. <laughs> Don't say that. And I've been playing since 1978. I'm sure some of you have heard that already. And I think back then, you know, we started with dungeons and you know from Dungeons and Dragons, right? We started with the, I was I started with original D and D, and so games were very linear. Especially if you're in a dungeon, obviously, right? <laughs> Going into the dungeon, you kill monsters and take their stuff, and you go from room to room. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, no. I mean, we were having fun, so that's why we play games. We still have fun doing that kind of crap. Right. So so that's the game it was built <laughs> on. And so when and when we came out of the dungeon, we still used that same linear story type of uh, adventures, right? That's the games that GMs ran because they just modified what they were using before and used it outside. And even... Modules kind of use that same uh, kind of... Modules definitely use that same kind of thing. Yeah, early I, I would like to put input here <laughs> that I think it, that a lot of it comes from the fact that D&D and, and role-playing games came out of miniature games. Of and, course, yeah. And miniature games came out of, of war, of, of, you know, generals standing around a table well, war with games. a big giant map trying to figure out how they're going to do things. And they've been doing that since the Roman times, even probably before, although there weren't pictures back then, so I'm sure you can't see it. But anyway... <laughs> well, I'm sure they use some sort of uh, maps and stuff. Strategy and, and things, strategies, right? right? And and I think, what is this? I think, is it what? Edgar Rice Burroughs, I think, or somebody like that. One of those big giants of literature uh, invented a game called Little Wars, which is about playing war games with army men. You know, I think they probably used wooden blocks or something like that. But anyway, so out of all that comes... And miniatures comes, you know, D&D. So that, that's why out. it's linear. Because you're, when you're planning a, 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 a an attack, uh, if, say, it's the Civil War, and you know those people love to yeah, plan, the play, play out the, yeah. So, so you plan out the whole thing, and you get your little guys ready, and you put them on the map, yeah. and then, then you go for it, right? So that's the simulation. Right. So that's very linear because you have a start and a finish. Hopefully you're alive at the finish, but you may, may, may or may not be, right? Especially well, you, with miniatures, but in role playing game, that's the idea, <laughs> or that was the idea at the time. Right, I agree. So you you go from people playing miniatures to miniature games, and uh, and it's starting inserting these ideas about you know what are these heroes uh, in you know what if we add heroes to the game and stuff, and that's what Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson did. You know they they took these war games and added the single player unit or champion unit. And then it, that became, you know, mm -hmm. role playing games as we first saw it in Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, I think if you look at the the title of Dungeons and Dragons original box, it is has very lengthy. Uh, uh, let me see if I can reach my box. Oh gosh! Go ahead, talk, say something. Oh, so here it is: <laughs> the rules for fantastic medieval war games campaigns playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. <laughs> <laughs> That's the subtitle of Dungeons and Dragons uh, original box, the the white little white boxes. So that tells you, you know, that tells you quite a bit. That obviously it stems from miniature games. Obviously it stems from from people who were into you know playing these complex, sometimes complex uh, war games. And so going into a dungeon and defeating monsters is kind of like a war game, right? Yeah. That kind of mentality. And then if you take that, even if you take the if you take the what you take the players out of the dungeon. Well, you know, it's can still you take that. The I mean, just, out of the players? I hear it every day. My son playing CS:GO. Oh, Jesus! He is a little general, telling everybody, yelling into his microphone, which way to go, where the where the bad guys are, whoever the bad guys are, terrorists or counter terrorists. I don't know. And he's telling people he's <laughs> berating them because they're not. I tell him that's not the way that a general is supposed to run his battlefield. You're supposed to be calm and tell people what to do, not yell at them. Well, he gets frustrated because they don't do what he tells them to do, and he's not the general, so there's <laughs> there is the problem. Well, you know, that's just it; is that he doesn't get to control other players' actions, right? Just like a D. So like that's a that's exactly game. the idea of this episode: is that should GMs be able to control your actions or let you do what you want, right? 
or sort of. uh, and and you have to find a balance between it, right? Right. So that, and that's why I'm talking about old style GMing, right? Where where players where players kind of you know they, they were stuck in, in in that in that well everybody was in that way of mode of playing. I would say from playing this this miniature game that added these role role play elements, and then people started you know doing other things that than fighting you know that there was more adventures de- dealing with intrigue or mysteries and they started you know it started expanding what role-playing w- meant and what it was so along those turn the lot but the problem with that is as players as you give more op- you know, options for players they also all, they also have opportunity to mess up your linear campaign or your linear <clears throat> adventure well, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I, I always say a player is never going to do what you think they're going to do. Right. And then, I mean, and, that, and that's a hard lesson to learn as a GM. I mean, I grew up in that era of GMing and my brother was weird because like not weird, but uh, he was weird. But, <laughs> you are not weird, Felipe. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, he didn't strictly go by that rule, you know, by that idea that we were stuck in a dungeon. He had a dungeon, but he also created a whole world of his own i'm gonna have to ask him if he had read lord of the rings before he started running the campaigns for you uh i don't know when he's i'm just i'm pretty sure he had read lord of the rings early because i know he had the books and i know he had read them and i hadn't because that could have expanded his view of of what the what the what you were doing should have looked like right because he made his own world i think he called it cardoza i think i still have one of the maps hand-drawn maps that he made for us and we, and what he did was he there was a very general made map and he had his own different cultures from different areas and different stuff like that and then as we adventured we would write on our copy of the map what we did or what we found because not everything was on that map and so you know including towns or villages and cities and and stuff like that so that was pretty cool so so i don't know i know I, honestly i don't remember what adventures we went on specifically but i just remember it didn't seem linear at all you know we we we, you know years and years we played and and you know i don't remember i don't remember how he ran the game i just remember we were just having a lot of fun no matter what we were doing and so i don't you know i never asked him well you know how did you create this adventure you know i was just a kid and playing the game so as as i grew older and started running games myself i was playing the linear game i would plan out a, an adventure i would think you know that they're going to turn left and at this point and turn right here and then they would get at the end of the adventure and bada bing bada boom they would have fun you know but you know as everyone knows who's ever gm they don't players don't always think or do what you think they're going to do which is part of the the thrill of playing the game right well normally you would say yes but i would say in the early 70s and even through the 80s almost 90s that was not the way people played people were like well we're playing the gm's game the gm is in control of the game the gm has total authority over this, the game. this is where the where well there is rule zero where the gm it is his world and he can do what he wants <laughs> yes i agree well there's the idea that players can you know have an ins- have a have a word in that in that adventure yes but what i was thinking was that that's where the adversarial GM comes from. The oh, idea of the adversarial GM. I think so. You know, you're going into a, there's only one way to get in. There's only one way to get out. Right. And if you don't do it the way the GM wants you to, you're going to die. Right. Or you're just going to do nothing until your hair falls out. Yeah. Or you so, pull so it those out. Are, so, <laughs> so people who, old school guys, Saul calls them grognards. I don't know where that comes from, but I guess from a French word from old soldier. <laughs> Well, th- there you go. <laughs> a lot of a lot of them, and I've met them. Some of them are my friends. Uh, they, one of my friends, Chris, he really thinks that the GM is out to get him sometimes. Yes, and he's played in games where that's exactly the case. Uh, where, and from his point of view. Yes, from his point of view. So in the the new new ideas of of running games and stuff, trying to be more player friendly and. Right. I think I think there was a shift, and and I think it has to do with uh, more people coming into the game, and also a little bit of psychology also coming in, right? The <laughs> idea that that you want to have that you want your players to have fun, and it's also a way to enjoy yourselves and do all kinds of different role playing things, right? And a lot of people come from a background where they've learned different different things, and they put those techniques into into gming and stuff oh yeah well you know i think you know one of the first 
I think incarnations of this different idea or tact was probably the vampire. You know, I hate to say, it, even though I've never played it, because because they call it a storytelling game, right? And I think they really wanted to tell stories, and and sure the GM was in charge, but you know the the stories didn't have to deal with killing or combat, though it could have been. But you know, you're it was talking more palace intrigue. You're or... talking about vampires, and, and they live forever. They're really powerful, and sure, they have to deal with some m- vampire hunter that they got to slap around, and you know, possibly you know, make into a vampire just to piss them off. But I think that there was a there was a different idea of what a game was about. It wasn't about killing monsters and taking their stuff because you're playing a monster. So what is there to do? So there's a lot of you know, like you said, court intrigue. There's you know, vying for power and who's in charge and all this stuff, you know, and and along along those lines came. You know, vampire was also easily adaptable was or was adaptable for people to play as a LARP. And in LARP, there's no, there's hardly, and there's probably no combat in LARPs. You know, it just doesn't happen. It's all about you know, you you know, you're given a, a as a character, you're given a goal to do whatever that goal is. You know, to curry favor of a certain character or or assure the assassination of a different character, whatever, whatever it is. And so when combat became not the primer, primary reason to play, then things changed. It became more of a, of a story to tell with each other. And for old GMs like me, I kind of laughed at that stuff, right? Back then I was like, well, that's weird, you know. But as I've grown older and experienced more you know, experience with different people and played different games, as a GM, you know, it took me a while to get that to that point where I've said, yeah, you know, I'm willing to let, let the players have a big say so in what the, where the game goes. Because trying to control players and trying to shoehorn them into this idea that I had as, as the way the adventure should go was sometimes difficult and sometimes, you know, caused a lot of problems. You know, people would get mad or people would get upset or people would just like, you know, tune out. You say vampire was the first one, but uh, I'm just saying that for me, that my first uh, when I first became cognizant of something like that was probably vampire. Because I remember playing Top Secret when I was a oh, teenager, yeah. and it was a totally different game than than D and D. I mean, I don't really remember everything we did because that was a long time ago, but I do remember that we had a lot of fun. Well, Top Secret is about. And when did Paranoia come out? Because it was a long time uh, ago too, mid '80s. And Dark Conspiracy. Uh, 90s, 91. 90s. I guess you could, and you could play it either way, but when you're playing games, mystery games, and or things you're trying to get, there's always an objective, right? Right. Whether you're solving in a murder or getting the princess or stealing the gold, there's an objective, and you don't know exactly how you're going to get there. Right. Well, Top Secret was different because I had bought Top Secret. I think, I think somebody bought it for me. I don't remember who, but anyway, probably I got, one of your sisters. I got the box set, you know, the early box set, and I and I remember the the adventure that was in it. I forget what it was called, but there was no adventure. It was just a setting. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? Because it didn't tell you this is what the player's going to do. Go from here to there. You know, there was no dungeon. It was just a setting. It was this, uh, uh, a, 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 a like a town, and I'm like with characters right fleshed out and stuff. And I'm like, what? This, this is an event. and I was really kind of I was young. I mean, I don't remember when Top Secret came out, but I was I was relatively young. I was like had to be teenager. in the '80s because I remember playing it. So, so how old were you when you start playing it? I don't know. <laughs> so what happens when, as a GM, you're trying to get out of that mindset of here's my here's my adventure, and you, the players, are the mice who have to figure their way out <laughs> from from the entrance of the maze through the <laughs> all the way through the end of the maze, right? Mm-hmm. Like trained rats. Yeah, well, players usually don't do that very well. Um, <laughs> well, now, I think in the old days, people would just, oh, yeah, this is what we're going to do. We're going to follow along. Well, yeah. I, I guess it depends on, and, and it, well, now, our, our friend Mike just recently said that um, it depends on the hook you give me. If I know that we're going to go do this and I feel, okay, well, that sounds fun. Let's go. Whether it's a big hook or not, whether it's just, you know, the GM wants me to go this way, fine. That kind of right. thing. But I think that a lot of times players want to investigate stuff. They want to jump on top of the building to see what's going on. And, and maybe you don't have anything planned for them to go on top of a building. So what do you do? 
one of the first things you can do as a GM to try to get yourself out of that old grognard type of mindset of running games is to say yes, right? But, you know, there's got to be a caveat to that because you don't want to say yes all the time to players. Because when, when players want to do something and you say no, that really chops them off at the knees. And if they're being inventive and they're being active and they're participating in your game and you say no, I think a lot of players might, oh, okay. You know, they'll sit back. Fine. And, yeah, you know, some might do that. I, I don't, I'm not thinking, I'm not saying that they'll they'll get mad, but they'll be kind of trained into not becoming, not saying inventive or creative stuff. If you keep saying no, because it doesn't fit into your game or your idea where your game should go. Like that idea, like, oh, I'm going to get on top of the roofs. And check out to see what I can see, right? And that seems like a good idea, you know. And but the GM goes, "Well, I didn't plan anything for the guy to in be in their up head. There. They're in saying their head, that, yeah. right? They're not going to tell you that." And so th- there's two things that the GM can say: No, you can't because the wall is too slick, too slippery. You just can't do it. Or they can say it's a you have to roll a twenty five in your something yeah. Let's scale. say it's Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, the DC is a thirty, and th- and so the player goes, "Okay, I'm rolling." I guess I can't even roll that. So, I, so you know, so they get discouraged either way. Right. So by saying yes, though, you give them, you know, oh, oh, good. So it was a good idea. So he climbs up there and, you know, and maybe you, you don't have anything planned for that as a GM, but you give them either, well, you get up there and really you don't see much or maybe you give them some, you, some you information. You see people milling around in front of the bar or, you, yeah, or you, you see people walking in their normal, doing their normal stuff. Right. They don't get anything of value, but you still say they get able to get up there and do something. You could also take it as an opportunity. Say you want them to go a certain in a, That's true. In, into a certain place. You could say, you see this, you see whoever or whatever you're following dart into this building. Right. Uh, instead of uh, instead of the way you thought about it, how the the hook would occur, you can use whatever they do to do that. You know, like mm-hmm. like you said, you know, like if they're following somebody, it means that as the GM. You have to be on your toes, right? Yes. The improv aspect of it. Yeah, and and that, you know, and we've discussed that before when we were talking about narrative narrative control and stuff with players. But I think, you know, as a GM these days, you definitely have to work on your improv skills because no matter what happens as a GM, you're going to come across players doing something that you have never thought of. And in certain circumstances, you can't tell them no because it's like there's no reason that they can't do something, right? You know, whatever that is. I mean, you know, if the guy says, oh, "I want to flip my 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 arms and fly up into the in, on top of the building," okay, so no. Is this the, a skill that you have? <laughs> is this a magical Do, spell? Can I see your character sheet? <laughs> and so no, no it's, and he's some guy in armor, like a paladin in full plate. Uh, you know, you could say you know that you could say no to that, right? That that's ridiculous. That that be, you know you can say no to things that are ridiculous or just absurd. I mean, or you can just start laughing and go. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Uh, can you show me how you do that, or tell me? Tell me exactly Sorry, how this let's, happens. Let's leave the let's leave the game for a moment and <laughs> let's discuss have a discussion. What are you talking about, dude? Right. So in those cases, I think you can say no, no problem. So say that say that um, you have a whole fight scene set up for them somewhere, and you want them to get there, but they don't want to do that. Well, then what do you do? I don't know. Would you? <laughs> you play with the wrong group, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, I like I said before. I used to plan things out like that, and I used to have these great ideas about what people would do. But I would leave so much. The players would would not in, encounter so much that it was kind of disheartening. Like I would have all these maps, and I would make a list of stuff. Like like you know, in the town, I. I I populated with all kinds of NPCs, you know, what they had inside their homes. If they were, if they were, if the players were going in and rob them or. Wow. That's a lot of work. That was a lot of work. And so, and then, you know, and then the players come and go in and go, okay, we're going to leave the town. I go, really? You know, what about all these? And I would throw all kinds of hooks about weird things happening. And they're like, ah, they're not interested. You know, I mean, they didn't say not interested. They just, they just ignored it. So, 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 So I'm like, okay. So all that planning and all those maps, in fact, one of those maps I didn't use until years later, until I ran uh, my third edition game when when we when we got everybody together, and which became the, the which was the monastery that you guys uh, cleansed of evil, and later became Fort Flint. I mean, it became this big deal 
this monastery that I, I had drawn. I had drawn all these maps and 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 you know put all kinds of stuff in them and stuff. So like you finally got to use it. See, so yeah, you it was only took, use it sooner or later. It only took me like you know so that happened in two thousand. It only took me like uh, I don't know, ten fifteen years <laughs> <laughs> to use that map. Well, I think that by allowing the players to go whichever way they wish to, yes, you can still have your encounters. You yes, just, I know you do the warp trans warp. No, thing. you don't even have to do that. You can just. You don't have to set your sit. So you have your storyline in your head, right? You're going. I'll just do a simple one. You need to go over there and rescue the princess. Okay. Total trope, right? <laughs> Total. Mike would go. Okay, I'm going to buy into that. We'll go rescue the princess, right? <laughs> Mike. Mike. Okay. Since he said that, I have that in my brain. Yes, I understand that's, that. that. But the idea that it doesn't really matter. So, so in my what I would do is I would put the. In my head, I would have the encounters that I thought, because I don't, when I say move stuff around, I don't really mean literally pick up the mountain and move it. Yeah. So you're going to encounter a bunch of hill troll, hill giants or yes. something. There probably should be a hill. But, um, <laughs> but well, the idea is that it doesn't really matter right. what they decide to do. You have a, an encounter planned, right? So when if when they look like they're bored trying to figure out what they're doing, here come the hill giants, right? Or you ha- you don't. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to go a certain way, but if you have your encounters created, then you are ready for when the action needs to happen. Or maybe and maybe a whole session doesn't have any action. They're sitting in a bar talking to people, figuring stuff out. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, we, you would discuss this before uh, how you would uh, continue to use the, the stuff that you plan to use. And, and, you know, maybe you make it more fluid as to where they're going to encounter this. And as a GM, that's a great idea, you know. And so what, what I was thinking also is that, you know, as when you say yes to players, you're, you're saying yes to their creativity, right? Mm-hmm. You're saying yes to their to what they're thinking of, and they're not being shot down at, or cut off at the knees by, by saying no. But also you can mitigate by saying yes and, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I think an, an important part of that is and as a, as a GM. So, you know, you don't say that, yes and, you know, to them, but you say, you know, they come up, there's, there's an article that you showed me yesterday, and it was really interesting because they had different ways of, of saying yes and and what it would mean in the game. And so what you do is you, you kind of, you know, let, let's say you, they use the sailing ship, right? And they, they're, they're, they're supposed to go to some port, and they do that by following another ship. And so... The, the players, for whatever reason, don't want to do that, or they they do something differently. So you you use what ideas they do you have, and you say yes, and well, this is going to happen. You say yes to what what they're going to do, and you kind of put like a condition modifier on it, going, and this is good. because you did this, this uh, this is this is going to be a result of what you're doing, and so what happens is is that players. You know, they get to play and do the things they want to do, but there's consequences for their actions, right? Let's say there's a, there's, there's that climbing the wall, right, to get on top. Yeah. You say, well, you know, you go, uh, he wants to climb the wall. You go, yes. You go, oh, yeah, you can do it. You know, make it an easy thing. But you notice that there might be somebody already standing on top of that thing. So they could still climb up there and try to, you know, get a good view and then get maybe get seen or get caught or whatever, whoever is up there, you know, then, but you might be more, the player might be more, you know, uh, excited to try to get up there. And say, Why is that guy up there? There's like three police officers standing up there and they're <laughs> looking for the burglar that broke in the second I story, see. man. Yes. <laughs> so what, what I think the, the important part is that you don't want, you don't want to cut creativity. You know, you don't want to, you don't want the players to think like, like they're not part of the story. And and as you, if you say, as you say yes to them, unfortunately, you're also saying yes to you having to come up with stuff on the fly that you hadn't written down, and that's that's you know that's a big problem or the biggest hurdle for a GM is to come up with stuff on the fly. But that's GMing. I mean, every GM, no matter how scripted you do, whatever you do, uh, how scripted your adventure is. You, people are going to come up with some wild stuff. You know, when we were playing Adventures League, right? Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, we had two characters, well, players, but characters, really, who wanted to do weird stuff. You know, one was my brother who wanted to put a bear trap on his back. A and big that bear trap. totally threw off the GM, but he let him do it. <laughs> so the GM... You know that, that 
that could be dangerous, right? <laughs> and he goes, I don't think that's gonna work the way you think it's gonna work, right? <laughs> and then there was and then there was Bay who who was we were in a room and, and the room had a weird like there was a wall that had slanted like like maybe a top of a chimney or something. And so he wanted to get up there and lie down or, or stand there and get like this advantage of not advantage, but to get this this look of he had his crossbow out and he wanted to be able to shoot down at, at the possible enemy that might come around the corner. And then the GM goes, this is what the GM said. He goes, well, that's not going to give you any kind of tactical advantage. <laughs> right? And my friend goes, oh, I don't care. I just want to look cool. <laughs> so, so then the GM goes, okay. Yeah. He said, yes, and, right? He goes, yes, you can do it. And it's not going to give you any tactical advantage. But to Bay, it didn't matter. He just wanted to be like in a cool spot, you know, that, you know, in his mind, it would have been something his character would want to do. And, you know, it would have been a different story, you know, if the GM had said, well, that's ridiculous. It's not going to give him tactical advantage. I'm not going to let him get up there. So, you, you know, the GM could have said no. So then Bay's all oh, okay. Well, and then in the recent game that we've been playing with, um, with our friend Jim, oh, yeah. um, he had a whole scenario planned out where we were supposed to actually have a a, a fight. Oh yeah, with the orcs outside. With the well, no, orcs? with the they were when, yeah, they were orcs when they saw Augustine the Atticus the troll, and right. they knew who he was, and they were like going Try after him, trying yeah. to trying to initiate a fight. Yes, and of course Augustine, we were playing Shadowrun. Augustine's like. Uh, the system's way too dangerous to be fighting these other people. The people with me are going to die. They're squishy. Yes, <laughs> so, me, for, for and so it was really interesting because because afterwards Jim goes, I wasn't expecting him to to talk, not, not take the to, take to, the to, yeah, take the bait. And so it made it a, a interesting experience not only for uh, Augustine but also for for the GM Jim because he hadn't expected that to happen. So right. he had to talk. He had to you know talk talk instead of fight right so his whole thing changed yeah and and he did and 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 he and afterwards he he goes i was i was shocked about this right but he did really good with the change you know just right and that's and and so that encounter didn't happen the way that he thought it would but he was on his feet doing well he wasn't on his feet but you know he was (laughs) he was in his chair i think we're all sitting in chairs (laughs) (laughs) but he might have even been on one of those standing desks that type of thing I don't think so. So you don't get trombone. But so so there's different things like that. So you just go with the flow, right? Right. And not only that, it when you do that, it engages the players and keeps them excited and interested in what you're doing. Right. Because the last thing you want is a bunch of bored players at your table going, Well, which way am I supposed to do it? Uh, (laughs) you know, like like trying to figure out what it is you want. What it's like it's like when when I sometimes I ask Saul a question and he gives me that look. Of, and I can tell he's thinking, what is it she wants me to say? And I'm like that's, going, <laughs> that's every husband. <laughs> I know. So, so, but you don't want that when you're playing a role playing game. I don't want that when I'm asking him a question. I actually want him to answer the question. But he's thinking in his head, how can I answer this without her getting upset? <laughs> so, so players, if players have to do that, it's going to be less fun for them, right? Yes. Where, or, and if they, they, or if they think there's a right way to do things yeah. that the GM wants, you know, I don't know. So engaging the players by allow saying yes to them, and as Saul says, giving them a consequence if it's a, if it's a, so the, so they want to turn the they, they want to turn the ship around and go back instead of encounter instead of going to where you want them to. Well, when they turn the ship around and go back, there's another ship or some you know. Well, or, I think I think in, in that example it was there, there they needed he wanted them to go to a certain port, so he kind of had this ship kind of following behind them. And they could easily outrun the ship because that one other one was heavier, right? You know, whatever. And so he goes, they're just going to outrun it. But they decide, no, we're not going to outrun it. We're going to turn around and see what this other ship wants. So, and he goes, and then the the player goes, uh, I want to close my gun ports to show that I'm not going to fire upon them or be threatening. Yeah. And I want to, but I want to be ready. The people behind the gun ports to be ready to shoot if we have to. And I and I'm gonna hide my Marines the, 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 underneath the deck, and so I'm just gonna be on the deck, and so so the GM he has to contend. Well, I want you to go to that port, so say no or or telling them, you know, that's a bad idea. That's like you know, that's really cutting the players off at the knees, you know. So so what he, what what in the article what he did he gave two examples of of you know the GM that says no, and then there's the GM that says yes and right, and so what happens is. 
according to the article, that when you say yes and, you're giving the players uh, freedom to do what they want. Which right? gives them a little bit of narrative control. Yeah, and 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 I think you know when you when you get to that point of role playing, the players feel like they have a a say a say in the in the story, and 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 you know and to me that causes them to be more invested in the game, you know, m- more willing to to really partake and participate. They're engaged. Engaged, that's the word. And that's what what, um, everything I read about being a good GM, (laughs) that's what you want. You want your players to be engaged and you want them to be feeling as if they are participating in this world that you've created. And by saying yes, and if you have to say and, or yes, and and exactly how are you going to do that? Or, and then it gives you a moment to come up with how you need to, in your brain, improvise. Right. MacGyver it <laughs> to get it to work for everybody. Yes. Or oh, maybe you need to take a break. You say yes. And then you go in the bathroom and go, Oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a podcast I listened to where uh, years ago, the, the GM had, that's what he started doing is that when they, because he had an open world kind of thing. And so when they would really throw him for a loop, he go, okay. You know, you can go ahead and do that, but I got to take a break. I got to go to the bathroom. And he'd sit in the bathroom for 20 minutes trying to think something up. So, <laughs> so his friends thought he had a problem? <laughs> no, no. It just, you know, it, they didn't think much of it until, like, every time they'd come up with something that obviously threw him for a loop, he'd have to go to the bathroom. So See, that wouldn't work for me because when you throw me for a loop, you can totally tell on my face <laughs> that I'm, like, all... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit of yeah, there's a little bit of acting involved for the, for the GM. So yeah, so there's all kinds of uh, different techniques that you can learn to be more improvisational, know, imp- be more improvisational. And this idea of yes and it comes from some sort of improv. Uh, what is it? Comedy improv. Comedy improv technique where they where they play that you know where right. they, they have five comics up there and they're telling the story and. Someone yeah. says something and then they go and then yes, the next person and, takes yes, over. Right. And the, and and the only rule they have is you can't say no to the, what the other comic had said. So you have to build upon the other comics storyline or wherever they're going. And and if you ever seen uh, uh, there's a there's a local thing called comedy sports. It was a it was a Yes, I went there with you. Yeah, so I have a seen it. Times. <laughs> no, no, I'm telling the, the people who are listening. So there was comedy sports and they had this thing, but it was also a TV show with Drew Carey, remember that? Yeah. I forget what the show was called. What's my line or something like that? You know, that something called? like that. Yeah. And so it was, and that kind of improvisation, improvis, that kind of <laughs> improv, improv, and skills along those lines really help a GM because it makes it helps you think on your feet and it helps you be able to deal with situations that you you know are not going to be ready for and part of it being a gm that's what's going to happen no matter how linear or how structured your your adventure is players are going to throw you for a loop and you have to deal with it and by telling and if you say no to them all the time you know you're just they're gonna, not going to be happy yeah. no yeah well, they're going to be disengaged yeah. and they're just going to like they're going to know and when it's not their turn they're going to be on their phone now and looking and playing chess or something yeah and that's you know to me that's not having fun and that's you know why are we playing a game if we're not having fun Right. There you go. There it is, I think. (laughs) (laughs) This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. You have a good day.